It is a force of nature that provides various forms of recreation, like hang gliding, sailing, and parasailing. Wind. It is also more commonly used around the world as a natural means of generating energy. But for all its benefits to humanity, it still remains a force to be reckoned with, as Mary and Willard Bristow found out July 18, 2002, while vacationing at Muskie Bay Lodge, Ontario. The American couple of St. Louis, Missouri, are looking after a fishing camp as a favor to the owners. The Bristows came to Muskie Bay seeking peace and a little leisure fishing. But what they are in for is a different matter altogether. Because the rusted cabins are without washrooms, Mary Bristow heads for the one in the lodge. But no sooner does she arrive than a strange, unshakable feeling comes over her, urging her to return to the cabin. What the Missouri woman sees in the distance confirms her intuition. And I saw a green wall coming across the lake. It was about a mile out from, the, from where we were out to the main lake. And uh, it was ominous. It was just a huge green wall coming at us. And I started screaming at my husband. Willard Bristow at first ignores his wife's warning concerned about the fishermen still out on Butler Lake, caught in the storm. The family of male relatives staying at Muskie Bay Lodge is assaulted by eight-foot waves. Their boats separate, steering one way for a nearby island and the other Muskie Bay Lodge. Realizing there is nothing he can do for the stranded fishermen, he hurries for the cabin. Inside, Mary Bristow takes shelter underneath the kitchen table. Her husband stands looking out the window, awestruck by the sight of pine trees snapping and Lund boats being driven ashore. One airborne boat collides with the back of the Bristol van. Despite his wife's pleas to take cover, Woolen Bristow continues to observe the destruction of the gale force winds. That is, until he encounters a brush with death and a two by four of lumber. This board came through the window and just came right past him and went into the wall behind him. I didn't have to ask him anymore to get under the table with me. He came willingly. All that is left for the American couple to do now, huddled together under the kitchen table, is pray. We weren't just praying, we were praying in earnest. I mean, so this thing was, was really serious. And the cabin was beautifully locked up to them, and it was like, it was going to go any night. As for the other boat breaking through the waves, it also makes it ashore at Muskie Bay Lodge. The fishermen race for the cabin. Some of the fishermen reach the island and luckily come across a cabin protected by forest. The cabin holds and the Bristow's prayers are finally answered as the storm subsides. The couple walks out onto the front porch to assess the property damage, clearing a path through the debris. There was no way to describe it other than maybe a war zone or something of that, of that kind. There had been several buildings down in front of our cabin down on the lake that were gone. They just weren't there anymore. There was one boat and motor that was up on top of a pine tree. The Bristow's videotaped this footage of the aftermath. A motorboat is wrapped around a tree. Others are piled on top of one another and debris litters the campground. Pine trees are even uprooted. 
You know, it looked like bombs had exploded or something. Everything tore up and down the driveway. What is so miraculous is that the violent winds leveled the cabins on either side of the Bristos, but for whatever reason, spared theirs. If that were not enough, the lodge that Mary Bristow's intuition told her to leave is nothing more than a heap of rubble. Had the Bristow's decided to take shelter there, they would have likely not survived. We were in the only place that we could have been safe, and that was in our cabin under that table. For some reason, we were left here, and we were spared for a reason. I'm still looking for that reason, but we were. The six fishermen who narrowly survived the storm return to the fishing camp and rejoice with their three relatives awaiting them. Although the gale force winds have passed Muskie Bay Lodge, their destruction is far from over. They flatten a staggering 30 million trees. On some roads, trees are piled up as high as two stories. 30 million trees over 1,500 square kilometers, and it all happened in 15 minutes. It is the largest forest blowdown in Ontario's history. Basically, the cause of them is wind pressure. In a forest environment, because you get a lot of funneling of winds in uh, narrow valleys and sometimes over ridges, they are more prone to getting very gusty wind conditions than over a vast flatlands. A downburst such as this occurs when a low pressure system combines with a thunderstorm, causing cold, dense air to plummet and sweep across the ground. When a jet stream teams up with a downdraft, winds may clock up to 250 kilometers per hour. But there is another kind of wind system that is even more terrifying and intense than a blowdown. As witnessed in Edmonton, Alberta on July 31st, 1987. It is known as the City of Champions. And there is a story behind how Edmonton earned this proud name. On Friday afternoon, July 31st, 1987, the sky is cloudless and the temperature is above 30 degrees Celsius. Over 900,000 Edmonton residents carry out their daily routines as they would at any other weekday. Brian Berger decides to take the day off work and spend time with his family in his trailer at Evergreen Mobile Home Park. The Edmonton Transit employee is playing a game with his six-year-old daughter, Christy, when he notices a sudden drop in temperature. It was hot, not a cloud in the sky, and all of a sudden it started getting real muggy, and then all of a sudden it started getting cloudy, windy, and really dark. Edmonton residents noticed the unusually warm temperatures beginning to change. Friday morning, got up and went to work like every other day. And it was just a gorgeous day, hot, really hot. Wasn't too much wind, just a calm, warm, warm day till 3 o'clock. Yeah, it was kind of like really, really hot and blue sky, and all of a sudden it was just black. Temporary Acting Sergeant Bill Clark also observes the foreboding weather as he looks out the window of North Division Police Station. It was just a hot day. I uh, remember being in the police station upstairs and you could see the clouds started rolling in. It started to get dark, like quick, within you know, probably 45 minutes. The temperature dropped too. I remember going outside about 15 minutes 
20 minutes after three, the temperature dropped big time, a huge temperature change. You know, there was obviously a storm coming. Meanwhile, working as a file clerk at Byers Transport Limited, Kathy Dobransky and several co-workers are on a coffee break. Suddenly, an early warning sign alerts them to danger. A bunch of us were sitting in the middle of the office, which was the coffee room, and the lights went out. Then the down. Edmonton Power reports over 200 homes and 67 city streets are flooded with 44 millimeters of torrential rain. There was so much rain in such a short period of time that it actually, the intersection was starting to flood. And then uh, I see a car and it's almost like it's floating through the intersection. During a power outage in the station, a few police officers listened to the tornado alert on a battery operated radio. Because funnel clouds are so unheard of in this region, temporary acting Sergeant Bill Clark is skeptical of the radio report that one actually touched down just outside the city. The guy was saying that a tornado had touched down in Beaumont, and that's south of Edmonton. And I'm thinking, oh, come on. Like, people around here would know what a tornado is. That was my first impression, that we just don't get those. And how do they know it was a tornado? And there's this turquoise color that's in between all these dark clouds. But where this color comes from, I don't know. But it's incredible. It's beautiful. But it's a warning also. All of a sudden, you had a very unstable situation. Not that common around the Edmonton area, but everything just came together at the right time. You need a bit of instability. You need the sun to heat the ground and warm things up and cause air to, to rise that to, will create this thundercloud. You also need a good supply of warm, moist air feeding in the ground because as this air rises, it will create a low pressure at the surface in a vacuum. What you also need is some cold, kind of cool, dry air that will come over top and cap the, that, that air rising. This will cause the rotation and with the, the, the storm develops into a, maybe a weak tornado or into a big tornado. On Friday, July, uh, 19, July 31st of 1987, everything came together to form a spectacular tornado development that occurred in Edmonton. The funnel cloud begins south of the city, taking a northerly course. It heads straight towards the southeastern industrial area, where Byers Transport is located. We walked out of the middle of the room and when we got towards some windows, we saw this wall of gray swirling mass coming at us. So that's when we knew something was up and we realized it was a tornado. We ran towards the loading dock and it was a metal, a sheet metal building and we thought, well, it's sheet metal, we'll be okay. The Bransky and her office mates each find a cement pole and hang on to it for their lives. But as it turns out, sheet metal is far from okay as the tornado rips through the building an unimaginable horror and a deafening roar. And we could see, you know, the building coming down and things flying around, you know, forklifts spinning around and things turning over. in the fury of the twister, the buyer's transport employees are being sucked into its updraft. I remember holding on and kind of sliding, being, being forced to slide away sort of thing, but we just held on to this pole, and I guess because it was probably anchored quite deep into the ground, we managed to all stay where we were. I lost my shoes, and I'm sure they blew off somewhere up. After what seems like hours instead of seconds, the twister finally passes through Edmonton's industrial area, leaving behind its path of devastation. There was nothing that looked the same. Nothing. Everything 
was just steel bent and insulation and straw and damage like oof. It's incredible. The workers of Byers Transport are spared. Before Dobransky has time to fathom what just happened, her concern immediately turns to her father and his safety. Shoeless in a state of shock, the foul clerk runs off toward her dad's workplace. Meanwhile, the two block wide tornado continues to sweep throughout the city making for Evergreen Mobile Home Park a highly vulnerable target for tornadoes. As the tornado rumbles towards the unsuspecting trailer park, the radio confirms the Berger family's worst fears. We turned on a radio and they had said that there was a tornado in the area. We kept watching the sky, and we found out the path of this thing was heading north, basically towards us. With no basement to take shelter in, the Edmonton transit worker and his wife whisked their two daughters into their station wagon. Remembering that his neighbor's two daughters are alone, Brian Berger searches for them and leads them to his car. Sadly, in all the excitement, he forgets about his golden lamp tied behind his trailer. When everyone is safe in his car, he makes a burst of speed out of the trailer park only to find himself directly in the twister's path. I started heading south out of the park when the tornado started coming in. And at one point, I was looking up at this thing and it scared me. He went to turn the last corner to get out of the park, and that's when it came into the park. And if I had to keep going the way I would have, I would have drove right into it. Swiftly veering right, Berger eludes the tornado, but he now has to weave his way through fallen trees on the road, flying debris, and even household appliances. I had to dodge a half-ton truck that cut me off, but there was no driver in the truck. There was debris, wires all over the place, and I thought, well, I'm gonna get out of here. When he reaches a safe distance away from the twister, Berger looks over his shoulder and witnesses the nightmare. When I turned, the damage I saw this thing doing was unreal. It was picking up trailers, which are 42, feet long basically and 17 feet wide and they were being picked up as if they were little match boxes. I thought we got hit with a bomb or something. I thought it was like a world war or something. I think I think it would have been 75 years since we even had a tornado. Never experienced anything like that in my life. Among the mobile homes attacked by the savage tornado is that of Monique Gregoire, who takes cover with her grandparents and brother. Her grandfather clutches her 10-day-old baby girl, Kristen. In a matter of moments, their trailer is turned into a heap of rock. Little Kristen is snatched from the arms of her grandfather and swept away by the twister. When Minnie Gregoire crawls out of the wreckage, she realizes Kristen is missing and cries for her lost baby. And all of a sudden you could hear the screaming and the moaning that just started coming to you. And people staggering out of this gloom. They go, oh my God. Back in the station wagon, Crouching on the car floor, six-year-old Christy Berger lifts up her head to catch a glimpse of a natural disaster. It was almost like a huge black cloud that was touching the ground, and it just 
every once in a while you'd see something shiny, what could be a house or a car, and it was probably the biggest, scariest, massive looking thing I will ever see in my life. Among the 600 park trailers, 133 are demolished, 39 are severely damaged, and the rest are left virtually untouched. And I just couldn't understand how this thing could be so big, destructive, but yet be so selective. I mean, trailers are only about 15 feet apart from each other. And this thing would take a trailer and destroy it, literally, but leave the one right beside it alone. After the tornado passes, Brian Berger turns his car around and heads for the trailer park. He searches for any survivors needing assistance. As it turns out, there are many victims, too many, in fact, to help. Nothing can prepare the Berger family for the tragic aftermath awaiting at Evergreen Park. In a matter of seconds, the trailer park is left in a heap of rubble and the Berger family heads back to offer their assistance. In what's left of Evergreen Park, the Burgers see parentless children wander aimlessly, looking for their mothers and fathers. Tornado victims suffer from visible injuries and acute shock, and all their faces appear to be in an almost zombie-like state. We notice people walking around, you know, I mean, totally disorientated, hurt, wet, confused. There were people aimlessly walking around in the tornadoes, not even a city block away. And they're just walking around with this daze on their face, like they didn't know what was happening. Everybody was in complete shock, complete shock. They turned the, the convenience store that they had there into the morgue. It was just horrible. There was everybody little kids looking for their moms and their dads. One image that lingers in Christie's memory is of a man still sitting on his recliner amidst the ruins of what was once Evergreen Mobile Park. Oblivious to his surroundings, he's in a catatonic trance. He had a beer in his hand, and everything except him and that recliner and that beer got sucked out of his living room window. And they found him like, hours later and he was just sitting there like whoa what happened like he was still watching TV the Berger family picks up three survivors all of whom sustained severe and horrifying injuries from the tornado the lady that we took on her right side I could have stuck my fist in the hole that she got punctured with she at this point she was already white either from loss of blood, shock, or whatever. And then we found a gentleman um, that had got hit with a piece of sheet metal just below the hairline and literally scalped them. I mean, the hair, there was just a little tab of hair holding his scalpel. And there was a, the 16-year-old lad had a piece of copper pipe stuck through his leg just above his knee. While Brian Berger rushes the tornado victims to the hospital, temporary acting sergeant Bill Clark is the first police officer to arrive. Four tornado victims in shock and covered with blood approach him for help. That's what I remember most about those people, just walking zombies, and there was nothing left of the trailers. There were trailers flipped over upside down, vehicles flipped over, um, trailers just gone. Where they would be, they weren't there anymore. You know, you couldn't drive on the roads because there was too much debris from all the uh, trailers, the lumber and everything all over the place. With no ambulances in sight, he helps the victims into his cruiser, and then comes across a disoriented woman holding a baby. Just then, a lady walks out of the rubble, and she's home carrying a baby. She just walks up to me and hands me this baby, and she says to me, this, this baby was born 10 days ago at the Charles Campbell, which is a hospital. And she gives it to me, and she keeps walking. I go, whoa, whose baby is this? I didn't know whose it was. She was obviously in shock. The police officer proceeds to wrap the bleeding infant in a blanket and get into his cruiser with the baby. 
Since none of the passengers are in any condition to take care of the rescued baby, he must drive with one arm around the baby girl. So I just put the baby on my lap and drove to the hospital because we had no ambulances coming. I just kept it wrapped up in the blanket on my lap and I remember pulling on its uh, fingers and toes just to make sure she was still alive. The baby is immediately taken to intensive care at the Royal Alexandra Hospital, but luckily she's in stable condition. All that remains now for the baby girl is for them to track down her mother. Nurses work round the clock, phoning police stations throughout the city and making inquiries. They finally locate a young woman who reported a missing child. She is Monique Gregoire, the mother of 10-day-old Kristen, the baby girl violently abducted by the tornado and hurled 90 meters away. Newspaper headlines would call her the Miracle Baby. A few days later, temporary acting sergeant Bill Clark returns to the hospital to have a photo taken with Kristen and her grateful mother. A few days later, the Edmonton Journal called me and asked me to come to the hospital and we had a picture taken. That was something special. Unfortunately, not all the stories have such a happy ending. The man who was scalped with a piece of sheet metal dies hours later in the hospital. My kids always played with um, the young kids that were killed. I believe one of the boys was pretty much his age, so that was quite devastating for them. Elsewhere in Edmonton, on the day of the Class 4 tornado, volunteer rescuers searched through the ruins for buried casualties. Everybody just kicked in 100%. I don't know how long it took crews to get there just after the tornado, but people were coming in just groves to help do whatever they needed to do. The volunteers' spirited city rallies together as hotel owners offer free accommodation to tornado victims, and many others open the doors to their homes. Thousands donate vast quantities of non-perishable food, furniture, clothing, and money. The outpouring of love and helpfulness to each other was absolutely incredible. And this was across the world. People were filling up uh, coin jars, apparently in bars in Italy of all places, and sending it. It was great. In response to the overwhelming generosity demonstrated by the city, the mayor officially declares Edmonton the city of champions. We admire the work that the fire department's done. And Police department, a lot of volunteer. The fire department at Sherd Park at that time that had gone out and searched the buildings and, and just did an incredible job. The twister, covering over 30 kilometers in total, claimed 27 lives and injured 300. Over 1,000 people were jobless overnight and thousands more homeless. 12. CN freight cars were blown off their tracks. Industrial areas lay in ruin, and entire neighborhoods were flattened. People were cut all their lives to have beautiful things or whatever, and then, you know, in the split second, it can be taken away from you. The amount of lives and homes and all that that have, were destroyed. In a ravine adjacent to the trailer park, residents would find reminders of that tragic day for years to come. We weren't allowed to go in the ravine. They were still finding body parts and animals and cars, and it was horrible. We were finding stuff like you wouldn't believe for years after. They're still finding things in the ravine from that tornado. Residential and commercial damage estimates reached as high as $300 million, making the Edmonton tornado one of Canada's most expensive natural disasters. Hence, July 31st of 1987 has been dubbed Black Friday in Canadian history. Although it happened over 15 years ago, the impact it had on many of the people's lives still remains. It's still a very huge fear 
of uh, storms. Whenever it's really, really hot out and the sky's blue, then, and all of a sudden a storm just shows up, my automatic reaction is it's gonna be a tornado. Never ever gonna live in a mobile home again. Um, Cause I just, I tried and couldn't do it. All of this land in this great big country of ours, why did a tornado come right into my front door? I look up a lot more than I used to. Always looking. Although tornadoes are no stranger to the prairies, what puts the Edmonton Twister in a class all of its own was the magnitude of its devastation. We all realize that such tornadoes have occurred in the past over the prairies, although very, very, very seldom. So we know it can happen. But for everything to come together right at the right time, and that is certainly a meteorological rarity. Another remarkable weather phenomenon that has baffled witnesses and experts is a tornado that didn't come from the sky but was spawned from the depths of a raging forest fire. Sometimes what makes a weather incident a scientific rarity is not so much what happens as when. It is February 1954, and this is the small coastal town of White Point, Nova Scotia. Wallace Wenzel, caretaker of the White Point Beach property, sleeps soundly in his bed until his log cabin begins to tremble and two wooden rafters above his head split in two while a roaring wind passes over his cabin. Large boulders, which are used to hold the chimney covers in place, were picked up and hurled several hundred feet. That was the force of it. As the Ambrose family sleeps through the night at their homestead, their barn is destroyed with some of its beams driven a foot deep into the ground. I not heard anything, which was strange. Everything was flat. And just these pieces of boards and shingles strewn down across the golf course. It took off from there and went down over the golf course, White Point Beach Golf Course, tearing up trees on the way, not too many, and uh, right down into the resort, White Point Beach Resort, where it tore part of the, uh, the seaward side off of the boathouse. The next morning, Lawrence Ambrose is baffled by what he sees, or rather what he does not see. He looked out that pantry window, which he did every morning to look out over the water, and the barn was gone. I guess he turned around, he said, Blanche, he said, the barn's gone. <laughs> it was flat and everything else, well, and it's strewn all over the field, and it made an awful mess, and it, it did a thorough job on it, too, it, uh, you know, because it was a strong barn. All the beams in it were strong, and then, you know, and it, it had, the force of it had, had blown those right down through the field, down to, to the golf course. This force of nature turns out to be a 300-foot-wide tornado that came and went like a thief in the night. Everyone was in bed when that went through here, even the next-door neighbors. They didn't even know it. So when everyone got up in the morning and, and saw the barn missing, they all looked and wondered, well, what happened last night? No one heard anything. Tornado sightings on the East Coast are something completely unheard of. We who live on the coast in Nova Scotia are familiar with very high winds. We have become used to them. However, this twister was unprecedented in our history. And uh, southeasters and southwesters are the norm, but twisters 
and natural disasters are rare. We don't have really bad storms around here. Sometimes we get a lot of wind or a lot of rain or a big snowstorm, and that is about it. We haven't had one since, or we haven't had one, had one before, so I hope we never have one again. <laughs> The fact that this baby twister happened in the dead of winter makes it an even greater meteorological oddity. Up here in Canada, when we say winter, automatically that means cold, blizzardy, snow. So under those particular type of conditions, it would be extremely rare, if not impossible, to get tornado development. In light of this scientific fact, the White Point Tornado of 1954 was an extremely rare, if not impossible, weather incident. Another incident involving a freak tornado occurs in British Columbia, August 17, 1958. Working for $3 a day on the Chaparron Ranch, 13-year-old Dave McCauley and his crew protect a hayfield from the flames of a nearby forest fire. I can recall uh, getting up in the morning and going for breakfast at the cookhouse and uh, preparing for the day. It was a very quiet morning, very warm, fairly early in the morning, no wind. It was almost uh, serene. And uh, we went to the uh, meadow and uh, we were um, in charge of guarding the fire lines. Shortly before lunch, the stormy forest fire gets out of control as prevailing winds abruptly change direction, spreading the fire across the fire lines. Couldn't stop uh, the fire at the line. It jumped the line and started spotting behind us. The fire approached uh, the hay meadow and we could see spot fires starting all over the place in behind us. And then that's when we got the direction to get out of there and head for the creek. As the farmhands rush for safety towards the creek, 40-foot high pines instantly begin to explode from the intensity of the inferno. What happened next is a phenomenon they had never before witnessed or imagined. Somehow, the exploding trees spawn a tornado, not just of wind, but of fire. We have literally fire in the middle of a tornado and the wind swirling all around you. The tornado was right on top of us. It sounded like a freight train just barely right down on your back. We ran as fast as we could across the hay meadow. Before Macaulay reaches the creek, he gets stuck in a pool of mud. One of his friends doubles back to his aid braving the heat of the fiery 30 kilometer per hour tornado. I noticed the fire devil uh, heading across the baled portion of the meadow on the north side of the creek and it was picking up bales and the bales weighed anywhere from 60 pounds to 110 pounds. It was clearing the swath through the bales of hay about 30, 40 meters wide, just picking it up, and it seemed like it was half a kilometer into the sky. How is it possible for a forest fire to create a blazing tornado? What spawns a fire devil, as they are sometimes called? Forest fires are interesting in that they create their own sort of environment, because when you look at a forest fire, what you're developing is a very hot spot compared to the surrounding atmosphere. And warm air being lighter than cold air will want to rise in this type of environment. So you've got one of your prime things that you need for tornado development, as I mentioned before, was some sort of a mechanism for forcing air upwards and preferably one that moves it up rapidly. As the blazing whirlwind skips over the water and 
ooze towards a nearby hay meadow, a young Macaulay blacks out from the extreme heat. Meanwhile, the hay field is spotted with fire. And two of Macaulay's fire crew get chased, picked up, and hurled in the air by the fire devil. Described as human torches in a newspaper headline, they sustain severe burns. When Macaulay comes to, he spots one of his crewmates who is severely burned staggering from the brush. It is his 16-year-old friend, Vern McDonald. He was burnt severely. I can just remember vividly as a picture on the wall. His clothes weren't burnt too severely, but the straw hat on his head was completely gone. The uh, wire rim in the straw hat was hanging around his neck, and uh, there was um, the leather band of the straw hat was stuck to his forehead. His skin was all blistered in black and red. Vern McDonald. Gordon Fraser and Macaulay are taken to the nearest hospital. Macaulay is treated primarily for trauma, but his friend, Vern McDonald, passes away in hospital due to the critical burns he sustained. Dave Macaulay will greatly miss him. He was always laughing. He was joyful, joking. He was uh, a real good friend. and. Uh, a happy individual. Uh, even that is, is difficult to, to recall because of what had happened and the results of the fire. A couple of days later, returning to work on the ranch, Macaulay runs into a few local ranch hands working approximately eight miles north of where the tornado incident happened. They recount something peculiar that they witnessed. He said uh, hay literally was starting to fall out of the uh, sky and they didn't know what it was from, but uh, I guess the intensity of that uh, tornado that was funneled from the uh, fire had carried the hay because the last I recall seeing the tornado, it was heading up across the road and you could see the dust uh, twigs and branches and hay and some you could literally see the bales of hay go up into the tornado and then uh, strings would let it go and then the hay would just... So to me it seemed like it was about uh, half a kilometer high. Macaulay has never forgotten, nor will he ever forget, the strange infernal phenomenon that chased him and his crew and claimed the life of his friend. Macaulay's brush with death from the fire devil had such an impact on his life that he went on to pursue a career in firefighting. He is currently the general manager of the First Nations Emergency Services in British Columbia. Not many other people have ever heard about, much less seen, a fire devil. But it serves as yet another example of how nature will always test the bounds of our comprehension. Although tornadoes are rare in Canada, compared to other parts of the continent, they can still strike us where and when we least expect them, sometimes with deadly consequences.